good morning everyone uh, i warmly welcome you all to another important webinar co organized by gmi sri and sri lankan college of internal medicine today we selected a topic which is related to your day to day practice called an update in management of type 2 diabetes mellitus before we start let me give you a few house people messages as usual this webinar is open to you enter up to 10 a no late attendees will be entertained thereafter please keep your microphone off and do not use transcription or doodling options which will definitely interrupt others and disturb the smooth flow of this webinar you may send your all your questions or queries through the zoom chat box to us and all your questions will be answered at the end of the webinar all successful participants will be received a e certificate according to ncpdc guideline for cpd after completion of feedback forms which will be displayed at the end of the webinar in the zoom chat box so uh, let me introduce today's uh, distinguished speaker which is again a great pleasure of mine to introduce this speaker to you dr sri vigneshwaran geeteswaran mbbs md fccp fscp dr geeteswaran is an honorary consultant physician and specialist in internal medicine he is a product of faculty of medicine university of colombo where he obtained his graduation at uh, year 2000 year 2000 He obtained MD in medicine in PGM College, University of Colombo, in 2004. He got through FRACP examination 2007. He obtained diploma in diabetes mellitus from Medway City, Liverpool University of uh, UK, in 2019, and he obtained fellowship for diabetes mellitus from uh, Medway City, Liverpool Academy of in 2022. He is a fellow of Sheridan College Physician and fellow of American College of Physician uh, from 2020, and he is a visiting uh, lecturer in uh, Faculty of Jaffna, and he has many publication in these fields and a lot of clinical expertise. He is currently working as a consultant physician in Teaching Hospital Jaffna uh, from 2011 up to now. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Geetheshwar to. Uh, start his talk on update in management of diabetes type 2 diabetes uh, dr geeteshwaran sir this session is over to you now thank you good morning everyone thank you himal for the kind words of introduction uh, first of all i would like to thank gmoa uh, sri knowledge academy and sri lanka college of internal medicine for giving me this opportunity to speak on update on the management of type 2 diabetes mellitus type 2 diabetes mellitus is a growing problem a huge problem uh, for the doctors and uh, the population uh, about one third of the patient we come across in our practice are diabetic so for a general practitioner for a physician for everybody diabetes is a challenge so that's why i took the uh, this topic to deliver to the audience uh, when we when we look at the global figures of the prevalence of diabetes and incidence of diabetes uh, about 463 million adults with type 2 diabetes in 2019 that is about 8.8% of the world population this is going to double in 2045 nearly 700 million people will be affected by diabetes and talking news is 79% of them by the low and middle income country so it's a huge burden for these countries they are already suffering from economic crisis and another bad news is one in two people are undiagnosed the global health expenditure for diabetes is huge that is in 2019 760 billion us dollars diabetes mellitus is having lot of morbidity and mortality diabetes mellitus is the major cause of blindness 
kidney failure, heart attacks, stroke, and non traumatic lower limb amputations. Adults with diabetes have a two to three fold of increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. In 2019, about 1.5 million deaths directly related to diabetes. It is estimated that 4.2 million deaths worldwide related to diabetes. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death globally. And due to the recent pandemic of COVID-19, uncontrolled diabetes patients have a high risk of severe symptoms and complications of COVID-19 infection. The Sri Lankan situation is also almost the same. Prevalence of diabetes in 20 to 79 years is about 10.7 from the studies done in 2019. In some studies done in uh, urban cities, urban prevalence is alarmingly high. 27.6% of them have type 2 diabetes and 30.3% of them have pre-diabetes. So about 60% of the population is affected, adult population is affected by diabetes and pre-diabetes. Let's move on how to diagnose type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is diagnosed simply by doing blood sugars. No need for high fi investigations. Fasting blood sugar more or equal to 126 milligram per deciliter. For postprandial blood sugar more than or equal to 200 milligram per deciliter. For HbA1c more than or equal to 6.5 percentage. In a symptomatic patient, even one reading is enough to diagnose diabetes mellitus. In an asymptomatic patient, you need a two readings for the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So it is very simple to diagnose type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes. You, all you have to do is blood sugar values. So in case sometimes you may do HbA1c reading. HbA1c is recently introduced, introduced for the diabetes diagnosis, but it has some limitations. Some situations like when the red cell survival is affected, uh, HbA1c is not reliably used. Like hemoglobinopathies, including sickle cell disease, thalassemia, we can't use HPRC. Pregnancy, again, second and third trimester and postpartum, we can't use diabetes because the red cell survival is affected. B6PD deficiency, HIV, hemodialysis, recent blood transfusion or blood loss, erythropoietin therapy, all these are uh, not indicated for HPRC measurement. If you are want to diagnose diabetes in one shot, that is one blood sample, you can do either PPBS or HbA1c together, or fasting blood sugar HbA1c together, and you can diagnose in a single reading uh, with two samples of two different tests and diagnose diabetes mellitus. Let's move on to the management of type two diabetes. So I am going to focus mainly on type two diabetes, which is the more prevalent disease. Uh, diet and exercise is the mainstay of the management, right? Whatever pharmacological management you do, diet and exercise are the mandatory things to do. Weight reduction is very important. Weight reduction reduces the insulin resistance and improves the insulin sensitivity so that it helps in the management of type 2 diabetes. And most of the and majority of patients with type 2 diabetes are obese. Patient education and participation is very important because diabetes the disease needs to be done every day in the management. A doctor or nurse cannot do alone in the management of diabetes. So patient education and participation is very important. Self-monitoring is very important because you have to control the diabetes. Doing a blood sugar every month or once in three months will not control the diabetes. So patients should be educated to control the diabetes by doing self-monitoring. Oral hypoglycemic agents are the mainstay of management of type 2 diabetes. As you all know, type 2 diabetes also, there is reduction in the beta cell function over time and they go into insulin deficiency later on. Initially, they have insulin resistance and sometimes hyperinsulinemia. But later on, because of the beta cell failure, they go into beta cell depletion and insulin deficiency. So you have to start insulin at some stage in type 2 diabetes also. 
So you don't wait until you get a complication. You start them early. Insulin deficiency occurs later on. So you start the insulin therapy early in the management of type 2 diabetes. And stopping smoking and excess alcohol consumption also very important in the management of diabetes because as you all know, may not know that smoking increases the incidence of diabetes. Excess alcohol consumption also because of the excess calories affect the diabetic control. Let's move on to the non-pharmacological management first. In that diabetic self-management and education and support is a very important tool. Diabetes, what is diabetic self-management and education and support? Is diabetes is should be educated to the patient and a continuous support should be given to the patient to manage their own diabetes. Because as I told you before, diabetes is a disease which needs daily management, decision changes and management changes. So a doctor seeing every month or a nurse seeing every month will not change the management very drastically. Unless the patient is involved, the patient is properly educated and good support is given to him. Diabetic control is a difficult thing to do. So when you give the diabetes self-management and education support is whenever you diagnose a diabetes patient, you have to start from there. And also annually, while you are screening for other complications and control, you have to do this PM, PSME, OS uh, support. And also whenever the patient develops a complication, you have to again give the diabetic support and education. And what are the ingredients of this diabetic self-management education and support? Nutrition. So good nutritional education is important. And the in, uh, advice regarding physical activity is also very important. Optimizing the metabolic control, how to do the self-management of cell monitoring of the blood sugar values is very important. And prevent the complication is important. Self-monitoring of blood sugar, SMBG is important in the management of diabetes benefits. So then when we do this diabetic self-management and education support, there is a small but statistically significant reduction of HPA1C levels observed. So it's very important to do this uh, treatment. And mobile phone intervention also reduces the HPA1C level significantly. That's where the nurse or the doctor give a call to the patient and check the blood sugar values time to time. Help them to reduce the blood sugar values significantly. Then medical nutritional therapy. The medical nutrition and therapy is dietary plan tailored for the patient with diabetes based on the medical lifestyle and personal factors. This is where we are not giving a fixed dietary plan which is difficult to adhere and failure rates are high. So we have to talk to the patient, uh, know about the patient lifestyle, background, uh, medical problems, personal factors and all and we have to give a dietary plan according to the patient. So that will uh, improve the complaints of the patient. Weight reduction is very important as I mentioned before. Majority of type 2 patients are obese and overweight. So weight reduction helps them to reduce the insulin resistance and control of the diabetes. So it increases the insulin secretion and reduces the insulin resistance. And there's a new concept that remission of diabetes. If a patient has early diabetes and obese or overweight, a 15 kilograms of weight reduction associated with remission of diabetes. So it's a good news. You can cure diabetes by controlling the weight to 15 kilograms. This is evidenced by direct trial. The trial done uh, on obese patient with diabetes, weight reduction proves to control, uh, eliminate the diabetes in these patients. Exercise. So exercise improves the control of diabetes diabetes. And this happens even in the in excess of weight loss, in independent of weight loss, it causes reduction in the blood sugar value because it improves the insulin sensitivity. So how much exercise we have to do? Aerobic exercises, 
that is about 30 to 60 minutes daily for five days per week. And you should not live more than two days without exercise. And you can do moderate intensity exercises like brisk walking or cycling for this duration. And if you want to do high intensity exercises like jogging, um, swimming and so on, you can do half of the exercise I mentioned before. In addition to that, resistant training, that is gym, gym like exercises, twice a week you have to do to strengthen your muscles. But there are certain contraindications like moderate to severe proliferative retinopathy or severe coronary artery disease. Resistant training is contraindicated because it can burst matters first. What's the place of bariatric surgery? In type 2 diabetes with obesity, where the other measures fail, you can go for bariatric surgery. Especially if the BMI is more than 40, in Asians, it is less, 37.5, you can go for bariatric surgery. If the BMI is 35 to 39.9, and Asians 32.5 to 37.4, when the optimum lifestyle changes and pharmacology therapy fail to achieve targets, you can go, go for bariatric surgery. And bariatric surgery is in the form of sleep gastrectomy, gastric tapering, and uh, bypass surgeries you can do. It causes a sustained weight loss. And with remission of diabetes, is possible with bariatric surgery. Diabetes causes significant stress to the patient from the time of diagnosis because their diet pattern is changed, lifestyle is changed. They have to monitor the blood sugar regularly. So it causes a significant stress to the patient. It's called diabetic distress. And some patients are depressed. So psychological interventions are important. Sometimes you may have to refer to the psychiatrist for this manager. The intervention improves the glycemic control also. There are studies showing significant, but a small reduction in the FBOC levels due to psychological interventions. Control of diabetes mellitus. So why do we have to control the diabetes mellitus? To reduce the complications and what's the risk of having control, good control is hypoglycemic risk. So you have to balance between the risk of complications and hypoglycemic risk. Both are not good. Generally, we advise HbA1c less than 7% for a good control. It's in the young patient with less comorbidities and a good lifespan, you have to go for a target of 7%. In elderly with comorbidities, limited life expectancy, you can go up to 8, 8% is reasonable. HPA1C levels and mortality, there's a U-shaped relationship. That is, if the HPA1C less than 6.5, the mortality increases because of the hypoglycemia and cardiovascular problems. If it is more than seven also, it increases. So you have to have a control less than seven to have a reduced mortality and morbidity. To achieve less than seven, you have to have fasting blood sugar between 80 to 130 milligram per deciliter and PPBS less than 180 milligram per deciliter. Let's move on to the pharmacological aspects of the management of type diabetes. When you diagnose a person with type 2 diabetes, the drug of choice is metformin. Metformin, we have a long experience. It's introduced in 1950s. So we have a long experience. It's a safe drug. It is very effective. That is, FP1C reduction from 1 to 2 percent can be achieved by metformin. It causes weight reduction. It has less risk of hypoglycemia. And also studies have shown it reduces the cardiovascular risk. So altogether, metformin is a good drug for type 2 diabetes, especially if they are overweight or obese, or even with normal BMI, metformin is a good drug. Metformin has its own side effects, especially GX effects, loss of appetite, metallic stays in the mouth, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, diarrhea, other common GA side effects. This is the side effect which limits the use of metformin. To avoid that, you can use metformin in a small dose and try to 
increase gradually. Don't load him with metformin like one gram TDS or something initially. You start with a small dose, 500 mg or 500 daily, and every two weeks you increase 500 mg uh, additional doses. And also you can ask the patient to take the metformin after me. And also slow release metformin preparations also have minimum GI defects. So in the meantime, if you can't control the diabetes, you can add a second line drug to control the diabetes. And once the metformin is increased the dose, you can stop the second line drug. Other important side effect of metformin is lactic acidosis. Although it's a dreaded side effect, but it's very rare. Metformin causes lactic acidosis in situations like acute renal failure, chronic renal failure with uh, EGFR less than 30, heart failure, liver failure. So if the organ failure is there, metformin is contraindicated. So that is why the lactic acidosis is less now. In a sick patient, that uh, metformin is not a good drug. But if he is stable clinically, it's a good drug. Other important side effect is B12 deficiency. If a person is on metformin large doses for a long time, they can get B12 deficiency. So B12 deficiency patient can have anemia, numbness of the limbs, difficulty in walking, and so on. So if you have symptoms of this, you have to check for B12 deficiency. So simply you can check the full blood count and check for macrocytosis. Or if the facility is available, you can do the B12 level, which is bit expensive. Uh, or otherwise, what you can do is you treat for B12 deficiency. With a B12 IM injection, you can give these patients. Because diabetes also causes peripheral neuropathy and B12 deficiency also causes B12 deficiency or peripheral neuropathy. So sometimes difficult to differentiate both. So let's move on to the contraindications of metformin. Acute or chronic renal failure where EGFR is less than 30, you can't use metformin. If the EGFR is less than 45, don't start metformin. If the patient is already on metformin, you continue. Don't start metformin or increase the dose if the EGFR is less than 45. So if the EGFR is less than 30, it is absolutely contrived. Respiratory failure, again, hypoxia can provoke lactic acidosis, so it's contrived. Liver failure, shock, acute ischemia. It can, it can be MI, limb ischemia, bowel ischemia. You can't use metformin at that situation. So what are these second line medications? When you start metformin, if you can't achieve the target HPA1C or if the patient is fluctuating not under control, you have to think about a second line drug. When you select a second line drug, there are several options available. But when you select it, you have to have certain requirement to select. Like cardiovascular safety is important because some of the drugs, especially the newly introduced drugs, have cardiovascular problems. So cardiovascular safety is important. And some of the new drugs have a cardiovascular benefit. So you have to consider both factors in this situation. Weight reduction is important. A drug you are going to add should not increase the weight. So that is very important because diabetes already obesity and overweight is a problem. And hypoglycemia, then the dreaded complication of diabetes, oral hypoglycemic agent is hypoglycemia. So it should the drug you are going to start should have a less risk of hypoglycemia. Other important thing for the our country, our treated countries is availability and cost also important. Some of the drugs are very expensive. You can just prescribe to a patient with a poor economic and social economic background. And efficacy also important. Efficacy, without efficacy, no point of adding a drug. So, what are the available second line medications? Sulfonylureas. They are well known drugs. They are also having a long history. Right? DPP4 inhibitors. Dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. I'll come back to that, but are they and is citadel with the and thiazolid ions, which are the pyoglitus or rosiglitus on group of drugs. SCLT2 inhibitors, they are recent on uh, novel uh, diabetic drugs, which is now available in the market. 
Then Pagle flows in, then Agle flows in, then Pagle flows in. GLP-1 receptor agonists or GLP uh, receptor uh, analogs. They are new drugs which is not really available in the market and very expensive drug. I'll come back to that later. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors, your ECABOs and Eglitol are the drugs which inhibit the uh, digestion of the disaccharides. The disaccharides and inhibitors, they force absorption of glucose to be less. And last is the insulin. And last, you have to come to the insulin at some stage. So let's move on to these drugs one by one. Sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas are insulin secretagogues. Secretagogues means they stimulate the insulin secretion from beta cells of the pancreas. These sulfonylureas do them with or without food. So if the patient takes a sulfonylurea drug without food, also it causes insulin secretion to be high. So that's why they cause hypoglycemia. That's a problem. And it causes weight gain. That's another problem with the sulfonylurea because the patient is hungry and they eat blood and causes weight gain. And insulin, as you all know, is an anabolic hormone that also causes insulin uh, weight gain. We have a very good history of sulfonylurea. 1960s is the first sulfonylurea was introduced in Germany, the 12 glutamine. So we have a good experience with sulfonylurea. We know their side effects and we know the drug very well. It has been used widely in countries, including Sri Lanka. So far, in our clinic patient, if you see their drug charts, sulfonylurea are the mainstay next to metformin, sulfonylurea are the mainstay in the management. Until recently, they are the second line drugs, but now they are overtaken by the other drug because of the side effects like hypoglycemia and weight gain. So, 12 glutamine, clopropamide are the first line drugs which have their own side effects. Especially, 12 glutamine has some cardiovascular side effects, so it's not uh, recommended to use 12 glutamine anymore. So, uh, in Sri Lanka, it's still available, but many of the Asian countries have stopped using 12 glutamine. In the BNF, also, it has been not there for a long time. Second generation sulfonylureas, glimenclamide, glipicide, and blood plasma, right? They are a little better than the first generation sulfonylureas in terms of hypoglycemia, but glibenclamide is a long-acting sulfonylurea which can cause hypoglycemia, which is contraindicated in elderly over 65 years. Blood plasma, glipicide are short-acting drugs. They are good in the form of side effect profile. Third generation sulfonylurea, glibenclamide, that also side effect profile is less. They say it's less weight gain and less hypoglycemia risk. Right, sulfonylurea. Uh, we uh, gone through this uh, earlier. But benefits are one thing is low cost. So it is low cost. That is for Asian countries, it's a good drug to use because we don't have much good uh, economy. And the patients are poor, so we have no other choice. They are effective. Their effect, the efficacy is equal to metformin. So about one to two percent HPA1C reduction can be achieved with sulfonylurea alone. We have a long experience with sulfonylurea, so it's a non uh, debit. It is free available, especially in the government sector, it's free available. The sector and are hypoglycemia risk is high, and weight gain is a problem. And some drugs like 12 glutamate has cardiovascular safety issues. Let's move on to the DPP4 inhibitors, type of 10 peptidase 4 inhibitors. Before I move on to the DPP4 inhibitors, I want to tell you something about the gut hormone called incretins. What are these incretins? Incretins are uh, hormones secreted from the gut in response to food when we consume food. There is a uh, hormone secreted from the gut which stimulates the insulin secretion and inhibits the glucose secretion. Not only they inhibit the uh, hungry, that is, they cause early satiety. So these drugs 
uh, these uh, hormones are utilized in the control of many of the athletes, decent drug, right? So these incretins, the TLP1, glucagon like peptide 1, uh, is the one example for incretin. Is metabolized by the dipeptide receptors for enzyme. So what we do here is we block the enzyme, so we will increase the increasing levels. So it's a new drug, right? Dipeptide receptors for drugs. Examples are citagliptin, taxagliptin, dinagliptin, bildagliptin, and alloagliptin. There are many other drugs on the pipeline. They are coming to the market. So Citagliptin was supposed to be approved in 2006. DPP for inhibitors, the benefit is they are very neutral. They are very neutral. And cardiovascular safety also neutral. They either cause cardiovascular mortality or improve the survival. So they are neutral. No risk of hypoglycemia. For these reasons, they are safe second line drugs. The disadvantages are they are high cost, the expensive drug. Efficacy is intermediate, 0.5 to 1 percent uh, equivalency reduction. And there is a thumb uh, risk of developing acute pancreatitis because it's middle with the pancreas, so it causes acute pancreatitis, but it is rare. Side. But certainly, if a patient is alcoholic, risk of uh, pancreatitis is the gold stone or something is there, you don't use the drug. In these patients. And there are some concerns about pancreatic carcinoma, but latest randomized trials and uh, meta analysis didn't show that pancreatic carcinoma is a risk. But you have to keep in mind that if a patient has history of pancreatic carcinoma, you should not use this drug. Let's move on to the SCLT2 inhibitors. What is this drug? Sodium glucose for transporter 2. Right, a transporter present in the proximal converted tubule of the kidneys, they absorb the glucose, filtered glucose into the blood right? The filtered glucose into the uh, conductive system, it's absorbed in the proximal converted tubule by this SGLT2 receptors. Right? So this receptors we know it for a long time. These transporters we know it for a long time. But recently also they are Scientists got interested and they wanted to block this transporter by the CLT2 inhibitors. So it's a novel method of reducing the blood sugar. You, what you do is you block the transporter so the glucose is excreted in the urine. Right? So it is different from the other drugs. So it causes uh, pass uh, glucose in the urine. So what are the examples? Infaglycosin, phenoglycosin, tepaglycosin. There are several other drugs are also coming. The benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors are surprisingly very good. After the researchers, the scientists got surprised that it's a wonder drug. Especially it causes weight reduction. Because glucose is lost in the urine, it causes significant weight reduction. And no hypoglycemic risk. No hypoglycemic risk. And studies have shown its benefit in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, like in my strokes, uh, peripheral vascular disease, it's beneficial. It reduces the morbidity and mortality. It has a mortality benefit, which is very important. And also it has effects on the heart failure. It has a very good effect on heart failure. It reduces the hospital admissions and mortality. Not only that, diabetic kidney disease, CKD, has a very good effect. It reduces the progression of chronic kidney disease in diabetes. It reduces the blood pressure. Also, it has a beneficial effect on lipid profile, like triglycerid reduction, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol reduction is possible with this SGLT2 inhibitors. So it's a good drug to give it into, to your patients. Next to metformin, it's now coming up. Now it's overtaking sulfonylurea and Isolated ions and HGLT, the uh, DPP for inhibitors, and it's coming as a second line drug in majority of patients like to diabetes. The disadvantages are because it causes urine to fill with glucose, can cause UDL, like anybody with uncontrolled diabetes passing 
glucose in the urine, it can cause UDI. Not only that, it can cause fungal infections in the genital. So one should be careful uh, not to prescribe if a patient has recurrent UTI and also ask them to take plenty of fluid. And also you have to keep the genitalia clean and avoid of fungal infection. The efficacy is intermediate, 0.5 to 1%. And also it can cause hypotension, hypovolemia due to dehydration. They don't take enough fluid, they will get hypovolemia. And if they don't take, the suppose if you take acid to inhibitors and fasting, it can cause euglacemic ketoacidosis. Can happen. And it can cause long bone fractures and unknown reason it can cause low limb amputation, which has been shown in some clinical trials. Definitely know what is the reason, but low limb amputations are slightly increased in these patients with two on HL2 inhibitors. So there are certain trials, evidence for HL2 inhibitor benefit. One is empiric outcome trial, which showed empagliflozin reduces the uh, cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalization in type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. 38% relative risk reduction was demonstrated in these patients. Study. Another study, CANVAS trial, shows canagliflozin in type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease increased several cardiovascular metabolic risk factors and reduces the cardiovascular mortality. It is also benefit in heart failure and renal impairment. Declared TME 58 clinical trial shows in type 2 diabetes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the fact is it results in lower rate of cardiovascular death than hospitalization, heart failure. Prudence trial shows anaglyclosin in renal and cardiovascular disease. Good outcome. So these trials are, and many more trials shows benefit of this SGLT2. Let's move on to the thiazolid diamonds. They are also known as glitazone, uh, rosiglitazone and thiaglitazone are the drugs. Uh, these drugs, when they are introduced, they have uh, people thought that we have found a novel drug, a good drug for the diabetic control because it causes uh, free fatty acids to be stored in the adipose cells. So it causes uh, a weight gain. And also it reduces, uh, decreases the leptin, so that increases the appetite. So these two side effects are main problem with uh, thiazolid diamonds, like thiazolidazone. So adipocyte, fat deposition in adipocytes causing weight gain and increase the appetite, so again causing weight gain. The action is, it causes, enhances the skeletal muscle sensitivity and reduces the hepatic glucose production. So let's look at the benefits of thiazolid diamonds. Efficacy is high, around 1 to 1.5% reduction of HbA1c, and no hypoglycemic risk. That's a benefit of this pyogenesis and hypoglycemic on. And also, it beneficial in NASH, non alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, in fact, it has been, in the absence of diabetes, also, it has been used as a treatment for NASH. It lowers the triglyceride level. So that's another benefit. But the disadvantages are high. It causes weight gain. It causes fluid retention. So it is without any problem. Also, patient can develop any. Or it can cause heart failure, renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, and worse with fibrosis. And also, it worsens heart failure. It worsens anemia because of the dilution. Because it causes fluid absorption, retention. It causes anemia due to dilution effect. And also, it causes osteoporosis. Because it causes uh, the osteoblast to be turned into fat cells, it causes osteoporosis. And there is a risk of developing bladder cancer. It's a small, very small risk, but there's a certain risk of developing bladder cancer. So if you are using pyogenesis, don't use it more than two years. And also, if a person is a smoker, or the renal stones, uh, bladder stones, or something where advanced cancer risk is there, you should not use pyogenesis. So we will move on to the GLP-1 receptor agonist or GLP analogs. They are incretin mimetics. So I told you about incretins, the hormones which secreted from the gut 
act on the pancreas, cause insulin secretion, and glucagon inhibition. So we are using GLP-1 analogs. GLP-1 alone you can't use because it is a short-acting hormone, very short-acting hormone, and locally acting hormone. So you have to use an analog or receptor agonist for that purpose. So what are the available in the market? Exenatide, the drug should be given as a injection, subcutaneous injection like insulin. It has to be given twice daily, exenatide. Diraglutide and lexicenatide, one daily injection. Albiglutide and dulaglutide are once a week, a long acting uh, one receptor agonist. Semaglutide also once a week injection it can be used as oral preparation also. There is a word oral preparation available for semaglutide. So what's the benefit of this SGL GLP1 receptor agonist? One is it causes profound weight loss. Weight loss. In an obese patient, it's a wonder drug. High efficacy is there. No risk of hypoglycemia because this GLP1 receptor agonist and even the PP4 inhibitors act when the food is there in the mouth. The incretin effect is there only if there is a food that is common. So it doesn't cause hypoglycemia. And it has shown benefit in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And also it's benefit in diabetic kidney disease. Like SGLP2 inhibitors, these also put in ischemic heart disease and my frog peripheral vascular disease and diabetic kidney disease. The disadvantages are, one thing is, the common side effect is anorexia, nausea, vomiting, because it causes, uh, inhibit the gastric emptying and causes satiety, so they will vomit. So that's a limiting factor for this drug. And also it can cause thyroid C-cell tumors. So if a patient has a C-cell tumor, is a medullary carcinoma of thyroid, if your patient has a family history or past history of medullary carcinoma of thyroid, you should not use this drug. This is also like CBP4 inhibitors can cause acute pentatitis. Other problem with this is it's an injectable, except semaglutide, they are injectable and patient acceptance is a problem like insulin. They are very expensive, not freely available in the market. Now, Diraglutide is available in Sri Lanka, even in Kepna, but very expensive. Then we move on to alpha glucosidase inhibitors, who are acarbose and miglitol. They act on the brush port of the intestine, where they inhibit the digestion of the carbohydrate. So the benefits are no weight gain, and it reduces the carbohydrate absorption. So it's a uh, Reduces the carbohydrate absorption. So it's a benefit in diabetic theory. The problem side causes GI side effects like diarrhea, bloating, petulance, and all. Because the undiagnosed, undigested disaccharides, disaccharides accumulate in the gut, and bacteria can cause uh, fermentation and cause problems. They are less effective. In the Western studies, they have said that they are less effective. Because one reason is maybe they don't take much carbohydrate, but it may be more effective in Asian population. Especially in Chinese studies, they have been shown that this drug is very effective. Insulin. So ultimately, we will end up with insulin in type 2 diabetes patient also. Because of the secondary oral hyperglycemic pain. And also, if the blood sugars are uncontrolled with all the medications for insulin early. The benefit is highest efficacy or most highest efficacy drug in the management of type 1 and type 2 diabetes is insulin. We have a long experience with insulin. It is physiological when, when there is insulin deficiency you are to give it the insulin so it's a physiology and available in the government sector. Disadvantages are insulin causes weight gain. Insulin, as you all know, is analog, it's analog, anabolic hormone, so it causes weight gain. It causes hypoglycemia. And it's an injectable preparation, so patient acceptance is a problem. And some of the analogs, insulin analogs, are expensive. So, what is the second line medication? How I can say? 
So if the patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease predominant, we have to go for SGLT2 inhibitors or GLT1 as a tagant. If the heart failure predominates, SGLT2 inhibitors are the preferred drugs. If the uh, diabetic kidney disease is present, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLT1 as a tagant are the drugs of the drug. If the weight is a concern, again, GLT1 is a tagant. So, SGLT2 inhibitors are the, the main second line drug. So, as you all see, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLT1 is a tagant indicated in majority of many patients, unlike early diagnostic and indicated in many people. The hypoglycemia is a concern. Again, DBP4 inhibitor, GLT1 is a tagant, SGLT2 inhibitors, and thiazolid can be used. If the host is a concern, like South Asian countries like Sri Lanka, sulfonylureas and thiazolid diodes can be considered. Then let's move on quickly to the insulin in type 2 diabetes. Insulin as an initial therapy, uh, you have to do in this situation. It's like if the RBS value is 300 milligram per deciliter in the first uh, presentation, you have to admit the patient and start insulin. If the HPA1C is more than 10 also, you have to start it. If the patient has profound weight loss, dehydration, heavily metabolic complication, you have to start it. If the patient has sepsis, trauma, in the perioperative period, if the patient has MI, hypersmolar, unketotic, dead, diabetic ketoacidosis, in these situations also, insulin is the the cup choice. So, in type 2 diabetes, how we are going to start the insulin? We are to start with the basal insulin therapy. Right? So, when the 3 or 4 oral hypoglycemic agent fail, you can start a basal insulin therapy. Basal insulin is a long acting insulin. You start at 10 pm in the night. You keep the oral hypoglycemic agents there and you start uh, basal insulin long acting insulin at better. How much do you start? 0.1 to 0.2 units per kilogram body weight or 10 units at 10 pm. The commonly used uh, long acting insulin is insulin large, which is a very good drug and which has a long acting drug. It's, uh, more than 24 hours it's acting and it has a smooth, beatless action. So it doesn't cause nocturnal hypoglycemia. So how do you tell hydrate it? Uh, every third day you check the blood, the fasting blood sugar, and depending on the fasting blood sugar, if it is high, you increase two units at a time. And another three days later, you increase two units at thereafter. For this basal insulin therapy, you don't have to admit the patient because hypoglycemia risk is low, so you don't have to admit the patient. In Sri Lanka, we can use NPH, that is the isopen insulin, but isopen insulin is not very good because it has an uh, intermediate action and also it has a P. So, patient can develop nocturnal hypoglycemia. So, once the basal insulin fail to achieve the target, you say a fasting blood sugar, you add a prandial insulin on top of the uh, basal insulin. So, maybe after lunch you can add uh, basal insulin. Before lunch you add the basal insulin. That is, you start 10 unit, 4 units of both uh, beta uh, prandial insulin or bolus insulin uh, or 10% of the basal insulin value. Titrate twice a week based on the PPBS value. Here you would consider the PPBS and titrate the value. If still not adequately controlled, you add another meal prandial insulin or bolus insulin. Like that, you can accelerate the treatment. That's another whether basal bolus regime, which is not commonly used for type 2 diabetes, type 1, type 1 diabetes, right? where you give a basal insulin at 10 pm and long acting insulin and uh, bolus insulin with each meal. So, other method of giving insulin is you stop all the uh, oral hypoglycemic agents, uh, but you can leave the metformin and give uh, mixed insulin. A split insulin regimen where pre mixed insulin 0.5 units per kilogram you can start with 
two thirty in the morning and one thirty in the night or evening. So some people give uh, half, divide half half, and little more than the half in the morning and little less than the half in the evening. That's more appropriate for our population. We consume more food in the night and the daytime. Then we think uh, talk about the cardiovascular risk reduction. Um, cardiovascular risk reduction in type 2 diabetes is difficult. In type 1 diabetes, a good type of uh, or a good glycemic control causes reduction in the cardiovascular mortality. But in type 2 diabetes, it's not so. It is multifactorial. So glycemic control alone does not cause uh, expected reduction in the uh, glycemic uh, cardiovascular mortality. So what you do is uh, you have to control many factors like good glycemic control, good blood pressure control, management of hypercholesteremia, smoking cessation, adequate exercise, healthy diet, weight reduction, and maintenance. In cases of secondary prevention, you start aspirin, or in severe high-risk patient, you start aspirin. So these things put together reduces cardiovascular risk reduction. Let's talk briefly about the diabetes mellitus and hypertension. If the blood pressure is 140 above or equal to 140 by 90, should be confirmed by multiple readings before confirming that they have hypertension. Or if a single reading is 180 by 110, you can, along with cardiovascular risk factor, you can con consider hypertension as the first visit itself. So, what is your target? If the patient has existing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so coronary artery disease, or the risk factor is cardiovascular risk factor is more than 15%, your target is less than 130 by 80. Others, low risk patient, less than 140 by 90 is the target blood pressure control. So what are the drugs you are going to give? You give either ACE inhibitors or AR. We are the first line drugs. But you should not combine ACE inhibitor AR with uh, in the same patient. So you go for ACE inhibitor or ARB to the maximum tolerated dose for hypertension as well as if the patient has uh, protein excretion in the urine that is across macroalbuminuria or microalbuminuria you go for ACE inhibitor ARB. In case of resistant hypertension where there are three drugs which including a diuretic fail to achieve the target of blood pressure you start a mineralocorticoid receptor agonist antagonist. That is spinolactone. So spinolactone may be indicated in resistant hypertension patients. So let's move on to the diabetes management and lipid management. Lipid management, as usual, lifestyle modification is very important. Uh, intensive, intensive lifestyle changes and glycemic control. If hyper triglyceridemia is more than 150, OHDL is less than 40 for men and 50 for female. So if you have a, it's called dyslipidemia. If the triglyceride is high more than 150 or HDL less than 40 in a male or 50 in a female, this patient should undergo intensive lifestyle modification and glycemic control. For triglyceride alone, uh, starting statins is not indicated. So if the patient has uh, for, with, uh, with, between 40 to 75 years without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, everybody they advise to start statin, a moderate intensity statin of 20 mg per, per, per day. That is, everybody with diabetes, 40 to 75 years, you have to start a moderate intensity statin. That is mentioned in the American Diabetic Association guideline. From 20 to 39 years, if they have diabetes, no need to add statin. But if they have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, start a statin, moderate statin. 45 to 40 to 75 percent, 45 years of patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, or if the patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, high intensity statins are indicated. That is 40 to 80 milligram of atherosclerotic is indicated. 
So all ages, diabetes with atherosclerotic cardiac disease is high intensity setting, is indicated. Even though they are less than 40 years, you have to give, even if they are four, less than 40 years, you have to give high intensity setting if they have uh, atherosclerotic cardiac disease. If the fasting triglyceride level is more than uh, 500, that's a risk of developing uh, acute pancreatitis. So you have to exclude the secondary course and start phenofibrin in that situation. So in this patient, don't give statin, you give phenofibrin, right? And once the triglyceride level less than 500, you can start, stop the phenofibrin and start the uh, statins. If the fasting triglyceride level between 175 to 499, lifestyle modification could be done. No indication for phenofibrin. Statins and phenofibrin, should not be given uh, together. Antiplatelet drugs and diabetes mellitus, secondary prevention, you have to give 75 to 162 milligram per day aspirin. Aspirin allergy, you can give clopidogrel. Dual antiplatelet therapy, that's aspirin and clopidogrel, even for one year after acute coronary syndrome. Long term treatment of dual antiplatelet drug after coronary intervention, high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk, you can give. So primary prevention, is there a place for aspirin? Is, is there increased cardiovascular risk? The patient has high cardiovascular risk, but discuss with the patient regarding pros and cons, risk of bleeding, and you can individualize treatment you can give to the patient. Pregnancy and diabetes. Diabetes in pregnancy has increased maternal and fetal complications. Like early pregnancy loss, preterm weight delivery, uh, preeclampsia, macroglossia, and for macrosomia and perinatal mortality will be there with blood sugar high values in the pregnant patient. This can be due to pre existing diabetes or pre gestational diabetes or gestational diabetes. Pre gestational diabetes nowadays is becoming more and more common because most of the people are getting diabetes so they become pregnant. High glycemic control before conception. Decrease the complication rate. Preconceptional counseling and management is very important in these patients. Gestational diabetes, when the diabetes is diagnosed, second and third trimester of pregnancy or gestational diabetes. So I skip that because of the time. The complications, acute complication, hypoglycemia, hyposmolar, hyperglycemic state, and I will eat or it also the acute complication, body complications, uh, microvascular complications like retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, and dermopathy, and microvascular complication, ischemic heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease. So, in summary, type 2 diabetes is a major non communicable disease in the world. Non pharmacological management like diet, exercise, and weight reductions are very effective and important. Metformin is the drug of choice. Second line drug selection affected by many factors. SGLT2 inhibitors and GLT1 subagonists have very special role in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, adrenal disease, and heart failure. They also pose significant weight there. Early initiation of insulin is beneficial. So, thank you very much, all of you, for the patient listening. Thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Kiteshwara, thank you for that uh, fascinating talk on type 2 diabetes and this update. And uh, we have a pile up a lot of questions with us. So uh, without further ado, shall we start this Q&A session? So the first question, uh, what is the best test to diagnose diabetes in a patient in CKD who is on dialysis? Dialysis. Yes, who's on hemodialysis? Yeah, I think the fasting blood sugar PPBS are um, uh, enough. HPA1C is not uh, reliable, so you have to go for because the red cell survival is affected. So, fasting blood sugar and PPBS are fairly enough. Right. Uh, next question uh, again uh, if a patient is not mm -hmm. symptomatic, how many readings uh, we need to diagnose type 2 diabetes? Yeah, as I mentioned, the two readings. 
either fasting blood sugar or PPBS or fasting blood sugar PPBS. The patient is asymptomatic. Two readings should be there. Or if they if you add HPA1C, fasting blood sugar and HPA1C or PPBS and HPA1C. Uh, if the two readings are high, you can diagnose diabetes. Uh, the same uh, under the same question, can we diagnose uh, di type two diabetes only on HbA1c value? Uh, that uh, is without symptoms. Yeah, it is possible. If you if we, uh, the problem is uh, um, doing it again is a problem. So I prefer to do it if you want to diagnose just a. PPBS or fasting blood sugar and HPA1C uh, together will be more reliable rather than doing alone on HPA1C. So I prefer to have two readings one fasting blood sugar and HPA1C or PPBS and HPA1C that is more reliable than because it's a simple test, you know, fasting blood sugar or PPBS. Uh, because HPA1C shows our three months control. So sometimes if a newly diagnosed diabetes, it may give a wrong reading. So, HPA1C alone may not be recommended for, alone is not recommended for diabetes type. Uh, uh, this is about the, the, the types of diabetes. What are the instances we suspect a patient who has a specific type of diabetes? What are the instances we suspect the patient has a specific type of diabetes? Yeah, certainly like uh, secondary diabetes or stay, uh, uh, yes. grade three diabetes or stage three diabetes, uh, class three diabetes, where uh, when you have a patient who is not obese, who doesn't have a fa family history of diabetes, uh, you have to suspect uh, secondary cause like pancreatitis or metabolic or uh, endocrine causes, maybe there. Oh, there is another quantity called. Uh, Modi, maturity on the diabetes is young, where patient is not that obese, but having features of type 2 diabetes, response to like, uh, oral glycemic drugs and uh, uh, dietary advice, they also can have uh, Modi, because they have strong families, the autosomal dominant inheritance, they have a strong families. So in this situation, you have to think about the secondary cause. Or maybe some features of Cushing syndrome, acromegaly, pheochromocytoma, those things may be there clinically, they are used as secondary diabetes managers. Uh, what are the preventive measures in the community we can apply to prevent developing of diabetes? Yeah, certainly because exercise is very important. No, exercise should be part and parcel of our lifestyle. So like cycling, walking, rather than using car and motorbike, you can, you can walk, especially if you can park your vehicle uh, long distance from your workplace, walk to the working place, using steps instead of lift and so on. The lifestyle modification is very important. Diet, diet of course, and, uh, avoiding sugary food, carbohydrate food, high calorie food, those are very important. Exercise and diet is important for the control of diabetes the COVID. and screening and early management uh, of uh, Next question is related to the, this, uh, this question as well. Uh, so what are the measures we can make, what are the we can take to prevent uh, pre-diabetes to getting the, to type 2 diabetes? Right. That's a good question. That We have a lot of pre-diabetic patients in the community. So we can do the same intervention like lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification is the mainstay, exercise and diet. They have to diet like a diabetic patient and do exercise as I mentioned before. Uh, that will prevent about 58% of some studies have shown 58% reduction in the turning into the diabetes. And also pharmacological therapy like metformin, a 500 BD or 850 BD will be able to prevent about 30% progressing into diabetes. So these two measures together will prevent them getting diabetes. Uh, right. Regarding the diet and the diabetic management, uh, what are your opinion on following diet methods when we manage the type 2 diabetes? Zero or low-carbohydrate diet or 
ketogenic diet right. there are two diet in that yeah so i think uh, it's very difficult to maintain a zero calorie diet or ketogenic diet not practically possible so we uh, don't advise like that we advise like no sugar so of course they will say low carbohydrate diet so in our custom we eat sort of good yeah from a sink of us and rice and those things so we have to limit that right uh, instead of green grams and uh, vegetables uh, dal and those things we can increase the amount and reduce the carbohydrate intake so purely a ketogenic diet is very difficult to achieve sustain achievement is very difficult but if you can if a patient willing to ad- adapt to that you can uh, encourage them there is no harm Uh, but mainly low calorie no sugar plenty of fibers and uh, complex carbohydrate diet is advised uh right uh there are some uh, questions and uh, the phenomenon coming up in the, into the scene uh, when we manage in diabetes regarding the sugar control Uh, what is the smog effect and the dawn effects in diabetes? Uh, smog effect is when there is a hypoglycemia in the night. Right? Uh, they get uh, hyper reflex hypoglycemia because of the uh, increased uh, catecholamines and cortisol and those things secreted. Uh, stress hormone secretion, they get a hypoglycemia in the uh, morning. So to detect that, you have to have a early morning or midnight rbs check so that you can detect the smog effect dome effect is when there is a morning hypoglycemia due to stress hormone is dome effect so that is they get hypoglycemia in the morning all right uh, how to manage patient with diabetes who have normal range of fast in blood sugar and increase ppbs while on the treatment Right. So that means you have uh, meals are high. That's a meal amount of calorie in the meals are high, and you may be taking a drug in the night, which is like metformin, which is controlling controlling the fasting blood sugar. So in this situation, your diet control is very important. High blood sugar medication, diet control is very important. You have to reduce the calories. Uh, if it's a type one diabetes, you can increase the short-acting insulin. Uh, Three meal to control the postprandial hyperglycemia. Uh, can we use metformin in a chronic liver cell disease? Uh, it's not advisable uh, if it's a severe chronic liver cell disease. Metformin can cause lactobacillus and many problems. So metformin is contraindicated in significant uh, chronic liver diseases like type C or something. Early liver disease you can use, but severe liver disease certainly you can't use at all. Yes. Uh, what is the manage initial management plan for extreme hyperglycemia? Uh, it means fasting blood sugar more than three hundred or HP one C more than ten. Yeah, certainly as I mentioned the next year, insulin is a treatment. If the patient is highly metabolically symptomatic, blood sugar is high. More than three hundred, if you have more than ten, definitely you have to admit them and start insulin. But our patient usually they refuse to get admitted. But anyway, the best thing because there is thing called uh, glucose toxicity to the beta cells. So it for the the more the more they exposed to hyperglycemia, the more damage it will be there. And later on, they become insulin dependent, depending on the duration and the high blood sugar values. So you have to control urgently. Blood sugar value. So admit them and give insulin for this patient. It is preferred. Uh, do we have to admit the patient for insulin therapy? Do we have to definitely admit the patient for the insulin therapy? Yeah, because they have. We can't predict. So if a patient insulin naive patient, they those who have never had insulin, if you don't admit them, they can get hypoglycemia. The community, if you start insulin, especially the short acting insulin. or mix with insulin you, you can get hypoglycemia that's a problem that's why we at least for 2 3 days we admit them 
adjust the doses and discharge and train them specially. The community is difficult to train them. We don't have diabetic nurses so, uh, in the community. So it's always advisable to admit them. But for basal insulin, no need to admit. Okay, because hypoglycemia risk is very low. Right. Uh, if this insulin is indicated, what are the best types of insulin you will recommend as initial therapy? Right. For the I think the uh, audience are asking the uh, names of the insulins. So. Yeah, certainly because uh, if you have type 2 diabetes, the basal insulin therapy is first line. Uh, that is, you continue the oral drugs and start basal insulin, glargine. Insulin glargine is the uh, number one drug, which is unfortunately not available in the market uh, in the government hospital is available in the market it's a bit expensive so other thing you can do in type 2 diabetes is stop the oral hypoglycemic agents uh, and uh, uh, you can continue the metformin and start the mixed start insulin mix mix insulin example is mixed start insulin there are other analogs available analog mix preparations are available like no more mix to give in 37 p like that, these mix preparations are also available. You can use them. For type 2 diabetes, these are the, the last questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the last question is uh, Can we use uh, sulfonylurea and methylene along in the same regime? Yeah, sulfonylurea causes hypoglycemia, insulin also causes hypoglycemia. So it's a bit of a risk. So I generally, by starting insulin, I don't give a glycoside or anything. But uh, the patient is very educated and knows hypoglycemia risk and hypoglycemia awareness is there, you can try. But usually there is a high risk of developing hypoglycemia. Uh, uh, this question is comes under this uh, the same question, sir. Yeah. Can we use methyl? Uh, sulfonylurea to reduce uh, insulin requirement in a patient with type 2 diabetes who no. is indicated to start insulin no actually not because both the insulin you are giving and you are secreted to go sulfonylurea causes more insulin so it's not a good idea metformin is the one which uh, causes insulin sensitivity to increase so metformin combination with insulin is very good uh, some people combine Pyglitazone also. Some people combine HCL inhibitors also. So those are okay, but sulfonylurea with insulin not a good idea because risk of hypoglycemia, weight gain, all are double. No? So that is not a good idea. Okay, sir. Uh, that will be all for the Q and A session. The, any 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 audience can uh, switch on the mic and ask any question they need if in in between and. Uh, they can ask any questions if you have. Oh, if uh, no question is available, we will uh, we can wind up the session. So before we close the session, I would like to thank Dr. Sri Vigneshwaran Gajeshwaran, the consultant physician and a specialist in internal medicine, who has joined with us to give us a very valuable talk on update in type two diabetes. And uh, same time, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. And same time, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lankan College of Internal Medicine to coordinate this session. Uh, coordinate this session um, on behalf of GMO Sri, especially uh, Dr. Ganaka Senrath and Dr. Nandini Jnana Prakash, who has coordinating with the net side. Last but the least, our uh, regular audience who is joining with us, uh, every Sunday with us. Thank you for all joining with us. And uh, you are seeing the registration link for the e-certificate in the chat box. You can fill it up and send to us and we will be sending the e-certificate. If you have any query regarding this topic, we have displayed another email uh, in the chat box. You can send those questions to, to these mails and we can send